And I'm just going to keep rolling. Yeah. So. Let's roll with it. Let's do it. You know the Florida Georgia Line song? Let's roll. Oh. They say it a lot. I don't know. What type of monks would Florida Georgia Line be? The ones that don't wear shoes. Probably. (laughs) The number of times someone was barefoot in season (laughs) two. I first just wanted to say thank you so much for Mm. joining us for this season. This is something that Leslie and I really enjoy getting to do. And we appreciate that you listen and share and that you come along with us on these journeys as we dive into the tapestry of church history. And this has been such a departure from last season. The hope is that each season has its own sort of feel and flavor. And there's so much to the tapestry of Christianity that with each strand, even within each strand are are different. And we've talked about that before in the first season. So thank you so much for joining us on this second season and hope you've gotten as much out of it as we have. And I know I have my role in this is kind of just to listen and make connections and learn. So thank you to Steph for putting all this together. Well, so this is going to be a great episode to go out on. And Leslie, thank you to all your behind the scenes work of making us sound good and not stutter and all that behind the scenes work. Really Absolutely. Grateful we get to do it. So far this season in the previous five episodes, we've been talking a lot about the formal church structure of popes and patriarchs and bishops and kings and emperors and lords and and all of those formal structures. But alongside those formal structures have been the monks and the monastic tradition. And we've certainly mentioned monks a lot. Oh yeah, Um, they're everywhere in this season. They're everywhere. And so I wanted to take some time to specifically talk about them. And there is, you know, often an overlap between the official church structure and the monastic structure. You can be both a monk and a priest. You can be a monk Mm. and a bishop, Mm. but you don't have to be a monk to be a bishop or to be a priest. So there, there is some overlap, but there also is a separateness there and a differentness there. And and sometimes the monastic sort of section of the church and the official section of the church don't always agree and, and can pull in different directions. So wanted to talk about these holy men and women who are joining these monastic communities and their the power that they wield within their communities and within their cultures as they live these lives of dedication and imitation of Christ. So we're going to do a pretty big swath of history (laughs) today. Um, We're going to go from about where we started with Constantine and about the the 300s and the 400s and get through the, really the middle of the medieval period. So hopefully the previous episodes will set you up for some kind of overall history about what's going on alongside this movement. But we really wanted to, to spot like this and look at this tradition as it goes from these individuals moving out into the desert to live these lives of, of dedication and asceticism and that growing in their, their wisdom and their holiness spreading and the development of communities around them and the establishment of monastic orders and the monastic way of life as a legitimate and codified way of life. And then what does it mean as those communities continue and grow and, and grow in that power? And what's this tension between this life of authentic dedication, and then finding out that there's a lot of earthly reward for living that life of dedication. That, Mm. you know, as you start out with these impulses to withdraw and to live these lives of kind of sold-out dedication to Jesus that's really rewarded in social capital and cultural capital. And so how does that then shape both individuals and the next generation and where the movement grows? Mm -hmm. And how does that differ from what we see today with similar trains of thought and status. And I'm interested to hear all of those things. To start with our history of monasticism, I think we're going to go back to eh, the 200s, maybe. So we'll start oh my. right right back at we the beginning. We have been in the 200s in so long. It's been since episode one. Oh, my and goodness. We, and we didn't even stay there for very long no. when we were there. Uh-huh. When... 
Christianity starts out, as we talked about in episode one, there's these cycles of persecution that it experiences. Mm -hmm. And there's this sense of, you know, if you are Christian, you may need to prove your devotion. And you Mm -hmm. may need to prove your devotion in the face of these persecutions. Mm -hmm. And, And there's the potential of martyrdom that goes along with that. And that gets termed red martyrdom. Red being symbolic for the shedding of blood. Okay. So you are, as, as a red martyr, you are experiencing some sort of bodily harm for the sake of your, of your faith. Well, as Christianity gains toleration after the Edict of Milan and as it becomes the official religion of the empire, there is less and then no more red martyrdom aspiring to give your all for Christ in that way isn't an option anymore, which I think. Probably a a good thing. Probably a good thing. Uh, But it it sort of raises this question of how do you give it all Mm -hmm. if you're not standing up in the face of this physical persecution? Mm -hmm. And so we have this idea of the white martyrdom that comes in of this idea of finding union with Jesus and his passion through renunciation and asceticism, through withdrawal and self-denial and sort of leaving the world. So it's this white martyrdom tradition that we're going to kind of pick up as we look at the, the seeds of monasticism. So typically... We pick up the story of monasticism in the fourth century with folks going out into the deserts of Egypt and Syria and kind of the Mesopotamian area. But there are people before then who are living in communities, living lives of renunciation, of singleness, specifically as women, of of not getting married, focusing on lives of prayer and mercy. Um, We've seen some of the early sources like the lives of early Christian women that wealthy Christian women in particular are funding these kind of monastic houses or these monastic communities. Hmm. So I think typically people will start the story of monasticism in the fourth century, and that's not unfair, but there are people who are trying to figure out how to live this life of renunciation from, from early on within the Christian tradition. So having acknowledged them, let's let's turn to the desert and to these desert mothers and fathers. So like I said, they are choosing to go out into the desert. Um, the desert is harsh. It is unhospitable. It is isolated. If you're going to be an ascetic and, and kind of live this sort of difficult life of of struggle and denial and self-denial. Desert's a good place Desert's a good place Mm -hmm. to do that. So initially, this is individuals going out and living hermit-like life. And so some of the big names here are Antony the Great, who was born to a wealthy family. He rejects that wealth. He goes and lives in in caves in the desert fighting demons in the desert. We'll, Hmm. We'll hear a lot of of fighting demons or struggling with demons as a common language for what's happening in this period. And there's a lot of, I think, interesting speculation about what these demons are understood to be. Of Are, are they understood to be kind of corporal, real beings? Are these psychological demons? Are these you know, symbolic of something within ourselves that we're struggling with. Is there any connection to Jesus's time in the desert? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. We have Jesus as the precedent here of going out and not eating, not drinking. The ascetic life is often very minimal food, Mm -hmm. very minimal water, you know, not indulging the body. And absolutely, Jesus's 40 days in the desert Mm -hmm. is a a model for that. So with Antony, he's out in his cave and as remote as he is, his reputation spreads. And this happens with a lot of these early desert fathers and mothers. Is their reputations get out as holy people mm. and wise people. Mm-hmm. And so people will come and ask for prayer, for wisdom. They will set up shop in the cave next door. But it's it's largely individuals kind of 
being in proximity, but not necessarily a community. That changes a little bit with Pacomius, who likely had a military background. And so he actually starts a community out in the desert dedicated to this monastic way of life, emphasizing manual labor and discipline. So he kind of picks that up mm -hmm. from his military background. And it's a very structured way of life. And this idea of cenobitic or communal monasticism is really the one that takes takes off. It's hard to renounce the world and to follow Christ. And there's a sense that we need guides and models and accountability. And there's a lot of emphasis on structure and obedience and discipline within the monastic tradition of, of yeah. you know, as you are submitting to Christ, doing that through submission to the authority of your abbot or abbess. Also, if you are off on your own, having spiritual revelation and isolation in the desert, it's really easy to get off base sure. theologically. And so there is kind of this sense, and, and by the time we get to St. Benedict, who writes the rule of St. Benedict that becomes used as one of the major rules and sets of community structure in medieval Europe. You mentioned that last episode, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so his rule becomes the rule that most communities adopt, it takes tremendous knowledge of self and, and kind of a really remarkable individual to be an anchorite, to go be truly off on your own in isolation. He really doesn't like monks who kind of bop around from monastery to monastery, again, because he, for him, I think you're not doing that, that submission part. You're right. hanging out till you don't like something and then you're leaving. And I that's see. not truly this, this life of renunciation and dedication. So by far, this Cenobitic style becomes the most dominant one. So I thought we would take a minute here to talk about like, what, what is it that monks are actually doing yeah. in these communities? And so some of the big rocks that we're going to look at are this idea of learning um, and teaching. That's a really strong theme we see again and again want to talk about work and prayer as work, but also mm -hmm. manual labor as work and the importance of both. And then kind of as an extension of manual labor, talking about trade and and property and the practicalities of living in community. Yeah. As I said, when desert mothers and fathers start going out to the desert, people start coming to them as spiritual mentors and spiritual guides. And there's very much a sense of you're not going to do the spiritual life on your own. There's a a phrase that I think it gets used a lot, which is, speak to me a word, Father, that I may live. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of as you go to these holy figures and say, you know, teach me that yeah. I that I may learn from you. So as that moves into the communal sort of side of things, there is that sense of your elders know things and, and learning from them. There's also this really strong idea of Reading the scriptures and reading here is a broad definition of both reading from a book, but also recitation and also listening. So okay. a lot of these communities, especially in the Syriac tradition, the scriptures are read at every meal. So as you're eating, you're listening. You're also reciting scripture. You may be reading a, a book. And we see a lot of schools generated out of these monastic communities because it's important to be able to study the scriptures and read the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But also a lot of the, the prayer structures that develop are recitation of things like the Psalms. So there's a very close um, association between all of those terms. And what's interesting is in the Syriac tradition in particular, the same word for reading is used to refer to all all three activities. Oh, that's both cool. sort of the visual mm -hmm. taking in of written word, the recitation of scripture, and then also the hearing of it. Well, that kind of like answers the question of if you're listening to an audiobook, is you it are still reading? reading? You are reading to the Syriac tradition. Yes, you indeed you are. Mm -hmm. So count your audiobooks and your podcasts mm -hmm. as you're reading. Okay, very good. I really like this quote from Ephraim the Syrian. He's a, a major Syriac theologian, but he's talking about reading. And he says, the scriptures are laid out like a mirror, and the person whose eye is luminous sees therein the image of truth. 
Ooh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's part of an extended poem that he has about scripture that's really, really beautiful. But there's this idea of, you know, the person whose eye is luminous. So that is the the practices of, of purification and restoration and and turning yourself from sort of the the film of the world that's covering your eyes to removing that so that you can see and then spending this time in scripture so that it is it reveals its secrets to you of this depth that you can look into and this truth that you will garner and gather and the Syriac tradition has a lot of th- this idea that like you're gonna keep getting depth out of that out of that scripture. So they don't there's not like one meaning that you find and you're done, but you're continually looking and seeing and learning. And I reference the Syriac tradition a lot here because there was a very strong Syriac monastic movement that really did a lot of writing in addition to thinking about what is this this work that we're doing? Like what what is the point of reading? What is the point of prayer? So it's a really rich tradition. So alongside this reading and teaching and learning, there is the work of prayer. So if we look at the rule of St. Benedict, that rule says that at these times, let us give praise to our creator for the judgments of his justice. That is lauds, prime, trice, sext, nun, vespers, and compline. And at night, let us rise to give him praise. So we've broken the day out into sections of prayers. And each week, the entire Psalter of 150 Psalms be recited and always begun anew at the night office on Sunday. Entire Psalter? Yep. So that's what you're doing on those seven times during the day is reciting through the Psalter. So you have to get through those 150 throughout the week. Mm Mm-hmm. Because at nighttime on Sunday, it it starts starts over. And there is a prescribed order. But one of the really interesting things with the rule of St. Benedict is actually how much flexibility there is in there. So Benedict says, if somebody doesn't like the order, they can do them in a different order Mm -hmm. as long as you get through all 150 in the week and start over every Sunday. Where's his rule coming from? Like where, why did that, why is that? That is a great question. I don't fully know the answer to it. Prayer is, right, conversation, with God. So that is one of the most important things for a monk to be doing in their pursuit of this life of dedication to God is to be in, be in conversation. And during this time there's not a need to create something brand new to have it be beneficial to you or to like they have no problem borrowing. So you have the Psalter, you have these songs to God that express this wide range of human emotion. So they're going to use that. Also, it's scripture. It's God's word to you. So there's this sense of, well, let's use the prayer book that God has oh. given up. And having time to pray these divine offices, to, to sing the Psalter, pray the Psalter, is really, really valuable to not only to the individual monks themselves and their spiritual development, but it's really respected work by the community. Benedicta Ward, who is a scholar who studies this, she writes a translation of the Lives of the Desert Fathers, which is a compilation of sayings and lives of some of these early monks that has been kept down through antiquity. And so she she does a translation of it. And the introduction of that translation She says that the monks are presented in the lives as the defenders, the guardians of the world's peace, constantly watching on frontiers, armed against the demons for the sake of mankind. Prayer was a great action to be fulfilled in the body politic. The monks were like trees purifying the atmosphere by their presence. Another scholar comments on some of Justinian's writings, and he says that Justinian makes the work of monks as an intrinsically holy act important among other things, for the health and prosperity of the empire. Hmm. So, again, our good friend Justinian. Here but he is again. This, this work of prayer and this intercession and defense of humanity and, and prayers for protection is work. Hmm. It's not just nice to have right. 
for your own self. It is for your own self, but also like you are doing something for the community. I see. And the community respects that and honors that. It's a high view of prayer. It's a very high view of of prayer and that prayer is effective and Mm. necessary and important. So we mentioned the reforms that came in under Louis the Pious, Mm -hmm. Charlemagne's son, Mm -hmm. that made the work of prayer, you praying even more during the day in that kind of that work being elevated above manual labor. There's this tension in monasticism between this work of prayer and then manual labor and other work. And there's, you know, a practical level of if you're living out in the desert, you have to eat and find water and right. do survive. But also there's a, a really strong understanding that physical labor, manual labor is important to your spiritual development. Mm-hmm. So there's a a story told in the sayings of early Christian monks about a monk who just thought he was going to do the most spiritual thing and he wasn't going to help any of his brothers, you know, find food or find water. He was just going to pray all day. So they say, okay, fine. (laughs) So he goes and he prays all day. They all have dinner and nobody calls him. At some point in the evening, he gets up out of his cell and he says, you never called me for dinner. And they say, you're so spiritual that you do not need food. We are earthy. (laughs) And since we want to eat, we work with our hands. But you have chosen the good part reading all day and not wanting to take earthly food. Wow, that's interesting. So like, pony up, buddy. Like, right, <laughs> like right. yes, the prayer part is good, but also... We are humans. We are humans and we need to eat and there's nothing wrong with that. So don't don't think that you're so spiritual that you forget right. your corporalness and forget kind of what the rest of the world is well, and there's having this, to do. They're, they're living in community together. So if this guy essentially says, call me for dinner, but I'm not going to help. Right. Like that's not very loving that's not to your point. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, this idea of, of manual labor becomes, it's used as a contemplative aid. It's, you know, way to stave off boredom. It's also a meditative act. You know, a lot of people will take up like a, basket weaving and creation of of things and and activities that are imbued with their prayer. Like we talked about the Shakers last season about doing everything you're doing as unto God. There's not a need to delineate sitting in your cell and praying from doing whatever daily task you need to do and prayer. This has just reminded me of the practice of the presence of God Brother Lawrence, this book written by this monk who worked in the kitchen, but the idea that everything he was doing was in the presence of God and is in the presence of God and that prayer is not necessarily this seven times a day. It is when I am working in the kitchen, when I am harvesting the food. This man, Sylvanus, you know, to say, I'm just going to do this spiritual thing all day a little bit missing the point of saying the spiritual is in working with our hands and in cultivating and and working with the earth. Absolutely. And so by the time we get to the 5th century, it's kind of generally frowned upon that monks would be supported by outside Hmm. gifts or donations. And they were expected to work and to contribute economically to the well-being of that community. Of, mm. Like you said, right? Everybody else in that monastic community is working, so Sylvanus doesn't get a pass just because he he wants to pray all day. <laughs> Sylvanus and, didn't make that mistake again. No, I don't I don't think he did. With this work then, there's a variety of work. And so I'd mentioned Pacomius, and so we have some records from his communities, and they have all of the trades and activities in their community that you would expect to find in a thriving Egyptian village. Some listed out things are mat making, ropes, baskets, metalworking, carpentry, camel driving, cloth making. Like they are doing it all. There's another federation huh. that we have a record of called the Paco Federation. Their their rule, so their like community instructions specifically call out that they make linen, hair cloths, ropes, baskets, books, and any other things that they can learn to make. That's that's anything. That's anything. There's another community, the Meladian community, that we have some letters from them. And so the letters and contracts show goods coming in and out. We have the monks 
participating in trade, prayers and requests for goods coming kind of in and out. There's borrowing, they're buying and selling property. Really, the clergy is super involved in the life of the neighboring village. They are no longer super far out in the desert, super isolated. They're now in communion and in community with the kind of world around them. And so that then gets us to this next question about property. So if you're going to yeah. be metalworking and doing carpentry and cloth making and have bakeries and be providing food to your neighbors who don't have food, which some of these monasteries are doing, mm -hmm. that's a lot of land and building and structure. And so we start to see that these communities are starting to hold more and more land. So we're around the 5th or 6th century now. As we continue into the medieval period, land is money. Yeah. So as these monasteries amass more land, they're amassing more wealth. And and you talked about in that episode, the medieval episode, I specifically am remembering when parents would bring their children to the monasteries and offer some sort of gift with it, money, land, property, something. So this there is this sense in which these communities a little bit need to be supported now by an outside helper. Yeah? They are certainly willing to take your donation. That is that is for sure. And by the time we get to the 6th century, religious institutions, so again, the kind of the formal church and the monastic communities, own a tremendous amount of property. Mm. And that's only going to continue to, to grow. So, you know, I think we need to kind of make a note here that when the monks start out, they are looped in with the poor in terms of people whom you should support financially. And they have this interesting role because they're also not part of the poor, at least in the communities that are thriving. Um, now, the community as a whole values the work of prayer that they are doing. And so there is a sense in which continues in which the local community will continue to give monetary donation and in-kind donation to the monastic community to help enable it to continue to do its work of prayer. When we get those reforms under Louis the Pious and that liturgical cycle takes up more time of the day, the consequence of spending more time in direct prayer means the monks are not spending their time doing manual labor out in the fields, kind of gets limited to domestic tasks, and then they start hiring local farmers to do the agricultural part of maintaining the monastic land. Oh, interesting. Land. Okay. There starts to become a bit of a, a kind of classism thing of you have a lot of the people entering the monasteries are from wealthy families. They are doing this work of prayer. They are not doing the manual work. And instead, the local farmers who are already doing manual labor are doing more manual labor for the sake of the monastic community. So as the medieval period goes through its reforms, it, it it starts to really challenge this idea of having so much time focused on prayer now and so little time focused on work. And there's some reforms in the 10th and 11th century, but they don't really stick because they still are using the same new breakdown of amount of time for prayer and amount of time for work. The Cistercians come in in the 12th century and they go back to the original rule of St. Benedict and go back to that more even balance between prayer and work. And okay. their reform is very successful. They kind of take over as the monastic order of, of choice and they re-legitimize that the, like monasticism as a holy calling and not just a... This is just kind of what you I, do and I, you make the I was going to say sham. Uh, um, hmm. Because this movement starts as people who are looking to live a life dedicated to Christ and so they they go out into the deserts, they form these communities, they live these lives of dedication, of renunciation, that's really respected by the community, it gets a lot of esteem, it becomes a really worthy thing to do. And as the generations go by, it garners more power, it garners more influence, it starts to become, not exclusively, but often the purview of the wealthy third, fourth sons, and it gets corrupted. There's plenty of stories of monasteries where they're feasting mm. every night and they all have mistresses on the side and it's performative. It's not mm -hmm. real and people see that and go, no, 
that's not what it is. You're doing it wrong. And then there's usually a reform movement that comes in that says, you've gotten away from the point of it. This is ridiculous. Uh, you know, calling back towards to the roots of the desert tradition. Mm-hmm. And then it, it goes again. The Cistercians are a great example of that. They start with this, let's return back to the rule of St. Benedict. They say, you know, we're, we're not going to take plush land that's easy to grow stuff on. We will only take your you know, land that's really hard to grow stuff on. Okay. Except for grass. Grass grows everywhere. Well, <sighs> if you can't grow plants and vegetables and, and things like that, what you can do on this craggy, jagged land is raise sheep. Well, sheep give you wool. Wool becomes the commodity of the later medieval period. And the Cistercians become really, really wealthy because they have a tremendous <laughs> amount of wool from <laughs> all of the sheep raising that they're doing. And eventually their order also then struggles with they have a ton of money. Huh. When you have a ton of money, yeah. it is hard to not spend it. It is hard to stick with your mm-hmm. your less exciting life and it's really easy to think oh well, we'll pay the we'll pay the neighborhood peasants to work the fields and we'll yeah. we'll do the prayer instead and so it you know even the Cistercians ultimately struggle they tried really hard to do the hard thing but the hard thing turned out to make them a lot of money and then they and they struggle with their reform movements and then we see the mendicant orders pop up and go look guys you're you're staying in your cloistered monasteries separated from the world. This this is not, like, you're not doing the thing that Jesus called you to do. You need to be out in the world. And so the mendicant orders are not, they're non-cloisters. So they're in the cities. They're serving the poor. Their, their work looks different. They're not tending to land anymore, but they're teaching or working with the sick or whatever it may be. And so you you have this kind of constant struggle, again, of this what starts as this very pious intention of dedication to Christ, and then you get a lot of social capital. And with yeah. that social capital, sometimes comes actual capital and actual money. Well, and you talked about in the medieval period, having all of that land was a big deal. Yep. And so, yeah, I could. they are human after all. They are. <laughs> They are. And this is not to say that, you know, all monks were corrupt and awful. It's certainly not, not true. But I do think this idea of, you know, what happens when this thing that you started off doing for passion and didn't care about the status or the money that came with it all of a sudden brings you status and money. Yeah. So we can maybe return to that in a moment. But I do, I do want to make a, a couple of notes about women because there are, from the very beginning, women involved in the monastic life as well. And so there are desert mothers in addition to the desert fathers. I think I mentioned this a little bit briefly, but we have evidence of Roman Christian women funding the early 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 monastic movements of these people choosing yeah. to live lives that are that are set apart. You know, there's an example of Paula the Elder who ultimately gives herself into poverty because she's so so dead set on, on giving and, and giving to the poor and, and also to these people trying to live lives of dedication and prayer. This is true for men as well, but I think particularly for women, when we talk about monasticism with women, we have to talk a little bit about how that choice was viewed because it's kind of the only choice that you have as a woman in this period if you don't want to get married. Along this time, there's also this cultural idea of kind of the glory of, of virginity and mm. this sort of marriage to Christ and, and not getting married and that giving you, you know, extra spiritual bonus points hmm. or something because you're not participating in, in pleasing of the flesh and corporal things. And so you're a little bit more spiritual and a little bit more better. And, and this period in particular, you know, there's a lot of Platonism hmm. that gets – integrated with Christian thought and this idea that the flesh and the body is bad and anything that's physically enjoyable, right? Good food, music is sinful and bad. And we Mm. can thank Augustine of Hippo for a little bit of that. At one point he hears music and is like, oh no, I enjoyed it. And that was awful because (laughs) because it's a physical thing and it's not a spiritual thing. And the spiritual things are always esoteric and out there. And so Uh there's this sort of obsession that develops around women's virginity and that being extra holy and... Hmm. So you have 
women who are called to the monastic life, women who don't want to get married, and this is their out. You also have, as we saw with Constantine the Sixth's wife, you know, women who are sent to monasteries as exile or punishment. The fact that priests can't marry is a Catholic tradition specific thing. So, and wasn't always the case. So when when priests could marry and when they did marry, when they became bishops, however, they weren't allowed to be married. So they had to divorce their wives oh, and then their wives had to go into a monastery. So you're having Again, to get some promotion. Exiling people to the monasteries. Exiling people to the monasteries. All of this to say, there's a number of reasons why people are entering monastic yeah. life. So I just wanted to make that note. Yeah. So as I was as I was going through this and this tension between doing this thing for passion that gets you social capital and fame and, and money, I just kind of kept coming up. The, the phrase that came to mind and especially when we think about the desert monks, is sold out for Jesus. I mean, how much more sold out yeah. are you going to be than you've left civilization and you were going and living <laughs> in a cave and you are fighting demons in a cave? Indeed. Um, that is pretty hardcore. That's about as sold out as you can be. Pretty. Other than being a red martyr and being killed, but when that wasn't happening anymore, yourself and escaping and, yeah. And it, you know, and as soon as I, that phrasing came to my head. I was like, wow, that's a really modern phrasing. And I'm pretty sure I've heard it sometime mm. in my life yeah. between youth group or, uh, you know, a Christian conference or something. But this idea of, you know, sold out for Jesus, life of full dedication. And it was an interesting one because I think there are earthly rewards um, that come from spiritual prowess and mm. a holiness. And I don't think that's restricted to Christianity. I think many traditions all traditions share that, you know, when you have someone who is a particularly holy or spiritual member of the community, that gives them certain clout um, and certain power. And what's so interesting to me is this, you were talking about these communities that would obtain wealth in some way, whether it be through wool or, you know, and, and then they start getting other people to do the work while they just focus on the spiritual and the prayer and all these things. There is this sort of idea that it can become a status thing, which is so interesting because when you think of monks now, you don't think of them as having high status. I mean, I've known a couple of people who have become monks and they just disappear. I mean, there's no status. People don't know what happens to them. It's not like you're going off and becoming, you know. So in modern day, for us to look at this and think... Oh, wow. Yeah. High status. Wealthy. Yes. That's just not what we would think of today for the monasteries. Yeah. I think we have a very different take on the work that mm -hmm. they're doing as a, you know, as a community. Just, Justinian thought that the work of a prayer of monks was critical to national security. Wow. Yeah. I remember I, you saying that. I, you know, we're not, we're not there mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in how we specifically as Americans, view that work. And so, yeah, it is It is really different in terms of how monasticism is viewed today and mm -hmm. not being this kind of this elevated career path. But I do, I do think there are corollaries that we can look at that help us understand this of I think about really popular Christian bloggers or speakers yeah. or really popular mm -hmm. Christian artists, pastors who are incredibly successful. You know, I think they all face some version of this of as you have success in that passion, I think it can get a little bit more complicated and a little bit more blurred perhaps about why you're doing things and, and what you're doing. And I think the dark side of this is the church has had a lot of struggles with calling out its own sin and its own mm -hmm. junk because it has institutions or people who have achieved this kind of social capital and social glory and they are still human and they are, do things that are not okay and mm -hmm. that are in some cases absolutely reprehensible but you've now blurred this like but, but we have this thing that has status and if we hmm. critique it if we call it out will we lose the status will we lose the thing will we lose the influence yeah um and you know if nothing else from the monastic move in the medieval period we can say they they critiqued themselves maybe not always quickly and maybe not always successfully but 
there's a lot of reform movements in mm-hmm. this whole period of this attempting to return and turn back and and get back to the core of things and to not get caught up in these trappings and these temptations as well. While it is true that in our day and age, thinking about monastic life being a sign of status and that being a really foreign thing, you are so right in that, you know, in these early centuries, that became the case just like it is the case today that you have megachurch pastors who are saying, I don't take a salary or I make $1 a year from my church, but they make millions in book deals. And so there's this sense of, there's this pious sense of, I am serving. And yet there is this massive safety net that, that their own congregants and the least of these in their community will never become close to having, you know? And it reminds me of the Preachers and Sneakers Instagram account. Are you familiar? I've seen a little bit of it. Okay, so for people who are listening that aren't familiar, this anonymous account went up, gosh, I think this is two or three years ago at this point, that would show pictures of these megachurch pastors and these worship leaders in clothing items. And then on the other side, they would list how much these things cost. And, you know, some of these main megachurch pastors are wearing shoes that are $1,500. For their casual wear. For their casual wear. And it made a lot of people really upset. You have to look at cultural implications, right? We live in a capitalist society. So is, there is this sense of they saved up for it or somebody gifted it to them. What's the big deal? But the big deal in question is if you've given your life to this sacrificial institution where Christ, the head of this tradition, was poverty-stricken, had, you know, didn't really have a place to stay from night to night, and you've submitted yourself to his teachings, what does it mean when you have high status and when you are comfortable and when you are wealthy, very, very wealthy, unusually wealthy. And I see so many parallels in that between these early century um, monastic movements and what we see today in Christian celebrity. And that's why church history is so important to look at and, and yeah, draw conclusions from. It is. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why I find this era of history really interesting is because this is when the church starts to really wrestle with these questions about what do you do with your wealth? What do you do with your power? The overall trend is you don't renounce it. There are, there are exceptions to that, but you know, by and large, Christendom doesn't run from the throne. It doesn't run from owning land. It doesn't. It, it tries to figure out how do you how do you steward those things. And I think there are mm. some cases that are better stewards than others. In grad school, I wrote a paper around giving to the poor in late antiquity because. Mm. There's a story of this young wealthy man from Alexandria, and he's about to get married off to a wealthy heiress, and he has this conviction of his spirit, and he runs away. And he sells everything he has, and he goes, and he becomes a beggar outside the front of a church. And he's held up as this example, this great example. He he rejected his material life and went and lived this life. And I remember reading it, and I was struck by the fact that he, he... gave his money to help the poor, and then joined the poor. We live in such an effectiveness of the dollar, and where's your dollar going? Well, like, he gave away so much money that then he was begging, and by people giving alms to him, that means sort of by default they're not giving alms to somebody else. Oh, that's interesting. So instead of continuing to be self-sufficient and kind of pay his own way, he's Mm -hmm. now in what essentially is voluntary poverty, alongside somebody for whom that poverty is not voluntary. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's like, that's really interesting. Polly mm-hmm. the Elder, who we talked about, when she gives, she gives herself into debt because she's wealthy enough that she can borrow money from people, right? If she was poor, poor, she wouldn't have been able to borrow any money. But she's wealthy enough, she gives away all of her money to the point that when she dies, her daughter's in debt up to her eyeballs. And Jerome, who's writing this letter, says like, it's only by the grace of, of God that her daughter could figure out how to pay off these debts. There's this tension of, giving to the poor to the point that you become yeah, that's part really of the, the 
poor. And it, it the, effic- the efficacy part of me that, like, doesn't want to, <laughs> poverty gets really yeah. frustrated by, like, well, that's, you're just adding to the problem. Uh, well, that's like Rich Mullins. Um, Are you familiar with Rich Mullins and kind of his his story? Yeah. And just how he, you know, he, he sets up a, a trust. His church oversaw his income. And so he was paid, I think it was, like, the average salary. He, he made a lot of money. He saw barely any of it. And he lived his last years on a Native American reservation in New Mexico. So while he didn't necessarily give to the point of poverty, he certainly was headed, could have been headed that direction. This is in the 90s where CCM is taking off and he's seeing right and left people who are coming into great wealth. And he saw the issues with that. But yeah, what happens when you give to the point of no longer having. Yeah, and I taught on that paper to a a Sunday school class, and we had some really great conversation about it because in late antiquity and what Paul is doing, she's not trying to alleviate poverty in her area. She's not trying to lift anyone out of poverty. She is doing a spiritual practice for herself of giving. Mm -hmm. So as long as she gives, it doesn't matter what the efficacy of her dollars are. That is not not her goal at all. Mm -hmm. And then we compared that with some of the modern takes on on giving where I think sometimes we can get so paralyzed of there are so many things that we can give to or support monetarily or our effort. I mean, there's, there are so many things worth caring about that sometimes it is so utterly overwhelming that we don't do anything or we can't find an organization that we fully support. So we just don't. And what the Sunday school and I talked to is talked about is like the answer is probably somewhere in the middle of we want our gifts, whether those are money in kind, time, energy, whatever it is, to go forth to change the world. And that is important. And so like, yes, please, please research the places that you're giving to and make sure that they are upstanding and are doing the work that you are hoping that they're doing. But also, if you can't find one that you're a hundred percent committed to, you might just have to (laughs) bite the bullet and like, and and do Mm. it anyway. Because that Mm. spiritual practice of giving is important. And the transformation that comes from giving, particularly in in context here of material things, it does matter. The answer is somewhere in the middle. I don't know what it is specifically, but it was a really great conversation with that group because, you know, okay, so people are giving to these monasteries. Well, these monasteries have full thriving economies and are buying land and are in turn donating cloth and food to the cities nearby when they're struggling with Mm. hunger. Like, okay, that's great. But like, maybe you should stop giving the domestic institution if it already has a surplus. And just as a modern person, I just, I struggled so much with why people were doing this and, and why they were giving themselves into such poverty. It felt irresponsible and not irresponsible in the Jesus is a reckless maverick kind of way, but like as a, this is, this is so about you at this point yeah. and like your spiritual, like it, it almost has become a like point of pride now of like, look, look how much you've given, look how far mm-hmm. you've, you've gone from your, you know, in the, the wealthy young man of Alexander, you've gone from your mansions to now homelessness. Like, look at yeah. you. You're so holy. Like, Oh, there's so much pride. Like, that just, that doesn't sit right. So looking at these stories, listening to these stories, even when they don't sit well with us, the fact that they don't sit well with us makes us ask these questions. When we get annoyed at the monks who are living in luxury, I I think that prompts us to ask, why why does that bother us? Because I think there's a lesson to be learned there about maybe what's just and right in the world. But to your point, this underlying question of the social capital you get from holiness is still around. Mm -hmm. And so when Sylvanus makes us uncomfortable, what can we see in his story that might help us see our world maybe a little bit differently? And maybe, you know, is it a little convicting in our, in our own lives? If I know there's been a lot of conversation in the last year about performative activism. So how do we, how do we take that discomfort that we feel about Sylvanus's performative spiritualism and reflect on ourselves and how do we how do we balance what we have and stewarding that and stewarding that well and I don't I don't think there is a unified answer for everyone on 
how much they should give, what they should give, how much it's they're allowed to make. I, I think anytime you set hard rules for that, you've kind of missed the point. But I do think this question of how do we steward what we have? Mm. And how do we steward what we have generously and in an open-handed way? Yes. I have really enjoyed where where this conversation has gone about monasticism, but also this season as a whole. And I think this is why history is important. This is why the stories of others are important. Again, whether these stories represent your own faith tradition or not, listening to these stories, looking at these stories, looking at these threads, they can prompt us to reflect and can convict us and to cause us to look at our own lives and the world in which we live in new and different ways. And that's really what we hope that you take from this season is some new things to think about, some new questions to ask, some new things to sit with and ruminate on. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate you joining us for Mm -hmm. our second season of Church Historia, and we wish you well until we meet again. Until we meet again. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Church Historia. We really appreciate you joining us on this journey. If you want more, you can always check on our website at churchhistoria.com where you can join our email list. And do be sure you subscribe to this show on your platform of choice so that you will always know when we have a new episode. And as always, if you enjoy what we do, we'd love it if you would share it with others as well. So if you like it, spread the word, tell your friends. We would be so grateful. Thanks so much. Thanks.